Do you trust God in prayer? Prayer. A paramount concern. We've spoken over the last couple of weeks about our right, our need to assemble and to engage in singing as we have already. What a wonder it is to be able to get together people of like mind, of like faith. To think about our God in heaven, our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ, and to engage in songs of praise and glory and honor. Songs that teach, songs that help. But of all the spiritual disciplines, as we might call them, prayer is possibly the most important. Well, it ranks right in there with all. In prayer, we speak to God. Well, in song, we do also. And when we come together and commune in the Lord's Supper, there is a fellowship between us and heaven. But when we think of prayer, Oh, how important it is that we pray, that we engage in prayer. Someone expressed it this way. It is prayer and only prayer that allows us into the deepest parts of our spiritual, of our spirit and his spirit. We really get into our thoughts, our minds, our inward, our feelings, our, 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 our longings, our hopes, our dreams, our concerns, all the things that were within us. And we get to put those into the presence of God in, his, in his, his throne room, before His mercy seat, when we pray. Question, how do you find or how do you receive good and find meaning in prayer. Deep and meaningful prayer is something that we must learn and develop in. So I say first off, pray. Pray. So I don't know how. I don't know what to say. I don't just go ahead and talk to God. You may have something you want to say to me of a personal nature about something going on in your life or or, or something about politics. I'll hear a lot about that. And you want to say something to me. And so what do you do? You say it. You talk to me. You don't necessarily know how I'm going to respond, do you? You might have some ideas about some things. So when it comes to you and God, pray. Just go ahead and pray. Just go ahead and talk to him. That's what prayer is, is speaking to God. And we must apply ourselves to it. So therefore, practice. You just keep practicing. You keep saying it. I suppose that you all had to do something publicly before a class when you were in school, didn't you? And I bet you took time to think about it, maybe writing thoughts down and maybe writing it out, and then you knew you were going to have to share it, so maybe you practiced it. Maybe you, I knew of a young man that was getting into preaching years ago that he called up someone and on the phone went over his whole sermon with that person so he could bounce it off of someone. I don't know that I'd want to have been on the other end of that line, but then again, uh, the person took it okay. Practicing. I want, some, I, I want to know that what I'm saying is effective, that it's going to be, with God, it's not really a question. But anyway, for our sake, let's practice. And I have, I've met those who have become, well, somewhat impatient, concerning their prayer life to the point of even maybe not praying, ceasing to pray, not praying much. And so, as the scripture would tell us, but I'm going to put it in a word, another word with a P on it, persistence. When it comes to prayer, if you're not much into prayer, pray. Just go ahead and start talking to God. And then just keep practicing it. And we'll talk more about that, learning and all. But, and then be persistent in it. Just keep it up. Make yourself pray. I'm not accustomed to praying often. Well, maybe we get out of the habit or we're not in it or something. We, we must push ourselves to pray, persist. Somebody said, but I never was really taught to pray. 
my, my family wasn't a praying family or there were prayers, but I just never really, you know, I kind of heard my dad pray or something, but I didn't pay much attention to it. And, and I never really learned. And the disciples of Jesus, handpicked by him, think about that, spending time with him, watching his every move, hearing his every word, and they were aware of his well, from what they could tell, attitudes and thoughts about others and events and all, they paid attention to him. Probably one of their shining moments. They had the wisdom. They had the foresight to go to Jesus and said, Lord, teach us to pray. You ever done that about anything? Maybe at work, you weren't certain about something, and you go to a coworker or maybe a supervisor, a manager, someone, and I'm not sure about this job. Can you instruct me more? Can you give me some insight? Can you give me some guidance? Lord, teach us to pray. They've been seeing him pray. They've been hearing him pray. And no doubt, <coughs> no doubt in their lifetime, they've been to the temple at least, and the synagogue, and they've heard prayers. But for some reason, they hadn't really learned to pray. Lord, teach us to pray. Maybe it's because they heard his prayers and how he spoke to his father, and they had never heard anybody speak like that, maybe. Lord, teach us to pray. So we can learn through listening to others. You know, like, I've never led a public prayer. Well, you listen to those who are leading public prayer, and you can pick up things from them. Now, I know, and it's not really a problem, it's not wrong, but we have sometimes those little phrases we use, don't we? Little phrases we use in prayer, and you can go from congregation to congregation. Someone gets up to lead a public prayer, you're going to hear some of those same little phrases, almost word for word. You can even go in amongst the denominational group, not associated with the churches of Christ, and you'll hear some of the same phrases being used. Why? Because they've been listening somebody long ago, and they were learning from them. And there's nothing wrong with that as long as our hearts, our minds are into it, and those listening are part of it. And so we learn from listening to the prayers of others, maybe at a dining table or wherever it may be. And you know something else we do and can do? We can read the scriptures and we can find prayers in there. Prayers about different things, different concerns, different periods of time in history. And we can learn from the prayers of those people, men and women. And we have an advantage I can go on here, and I can go on my laptop, or you can go on your computer. You could probably put in prayers in the Bible, just something simple like that. And you would find listings that people have done, sometimes with discussion, sometimes just the scriptures posted, of prayers. And you can read those, and you can learn. Now, I don't know why I'm telling you, because most of you are, probably know as much or more about it, you know, prayer and all, or, and some computers than I do. But... And I can point at my wife. Because you talk about somebody who knows how to search and find information. You open your mouth to start to ask a question, wonder about something, and she's got the answer. I don't know what I'm going to do when she retires. I'm going to be learning a lot. <laughs> but we can learn through listening and through studying. And there are even books written about prayer if you care to get a book and read it or get it online. And so we can learn to pray. There are ways to learn to pray and to learn to pray what we might feel a more effective prayer, but God knows different. He, every prayer spoken to God is effective, I believe. If you're putting yourself into it, you love God, you love your neighbors, you're trying. God's there listening. So it's my plan for us to bring to our attention some truths and, about prayer that maybe will encourage us. We need to first... Understand that prayer is connecting with God. And that we should pray expecting changes to occur. Our prayer should have some impact. We should expect that. And third, keep it simple. That's what the wife said to the husband about his sermon, wasn't it? Some of you heard that story. You remember? How many of you know K-I-S-S? -S? Yeah. Passed a note to her husband, K-I-S-S. -S, and oh, he felt so good about it. But it, it really what she was saying is keep it simple, stupid. Or keep it simple, sermonizer. Let's be nice. 
So prayer is connecting with God. That's what it is. It's connecting with God. Just like you connect with your spouse or a friend, a neighbor, a co-worker. You make some connection. We make some connection with God. Prayer is about communicating with our Creator. Now for some, that's overburdening. He's powerful. He's amazing. How do I talk with somebody who's so wise, so knowledgeable? He's so wise and so knowledgeable so he can figure out your words and your thoughts and your meanings. Can he? Prayer. Connect with God. Communicate with the Creator. What are some of the results of connecting with God daily? Connecting with Him often. Persisting in prayer. Continually in prayer. In prayer, we connect with God's power. We connect with His power. He's an almighty God, all-powerful, able to do beyond our imagination, our, our comprehension. We connect with God's power, with His might. And it can flow through us and strengthen us spiritually, mentally, impact our physical beings, our whole being. It can, God is powerful. Connect with it. In prayer, we connect with God's will for us. And we're thus aided in our daily decisions, given wisdom or allowed to think more deeper about things as we've connected with God and His will, speaking to Him about what's going on and what His desires might be, kind of learning from Scripture about those kind of things. In prayer, we connect with God's purity. Forgive us this day. Forgive us, Lord. Be merciful. Be gracious. We connect with His purity. We become better equipped and able to resist temptation as we talk to God and think about His goodness, His perfection. Look at His Son upon this earth and look at how God is impacting the lives of men and women throughout history. Look at the scriptures and see how their lives were changed for the better. Connect with God's purity in prayer. We connect with God's grace and mercy. That aids us to be more forgiving of other people, more merciful, more compassionate toward other people. Understanding that God is there as a compassionate God willing to forgive. What is the greatest example of God's grace and mercy? We're going to partake of the Lord's Supper soon, aren't we? The body and the blood of Jesus. God's willingness to give His Son upon the cross of Calvary for the sins of the world. And when we talk to God about our, tr our struggles and the struggles of others around us, maybe the, the disconnects we have with others and how things have entered in that ought not to, pray to God. Connect with His grace. Connect with His mercy. Connect with His forgiveness. When's the last time, I shouldn't have to ask this group of people, are you out there maybe, but when's the last time you ask God for forgiveness for something? I hope we do it often. Well, in a sense, I hope we do, because we're supposed to be a people who are striving to sin less. Shall we sin that grace may abound? The Apostle Paul says, No. But when we do sin, what do we do? Go to God and ask Him for forgiveness. Connect with Him, with His love and with His care and with His mercy, His forgiveness. You know, daily we face challenges that I believe assert our need to connect more and more with our Father in heaven. Do you have struggles daily? Do you have things that come upon you you're concerned about? Bills being paid? Situations with a, a friend, a neighbor, sometimes with ourselves. We need to connect with God. This goes back a way, 1992, a survey. It was um, in a, a thing called the Discipleship Journal. I came across this in a search of the, a few, few days ago, several days ago, I don't know. Um, and they were ranking areas of greatest spiritual challenges. This was dated 11-12-92. It goes back a little ways, doesn't it? Yes. 
but it doesn't change. I don't think it's changed from the time, biblical times, and that's a long period of history from creation to John the Apostle on the island of Patmos. Spiritual, greatest spiritual challenges to them as they rank them, or as it worked out in the survey, materialism. Is that a daily challenge? Materialism. I guess that would have to do with maybe bills, roof over the head, clothing, what's going on with taxes, and all kind of things like that of a material, physical nature upon this earth. Secondly, was listed pride. Pride. It's a challenge. Maybe in the workplace. Maybe with a mate. Maybe with friends. Self-centeredness. Laziness. Oh, we have so many means for laziness these days. But I can find reasons as to why I must sit and be on my laptop. Now, sometimes it's, it's part of what I'm doing and part of my study, my research. And so, but, you know, I won't go into any more, Peggy. Um, and then they had a, <coughs> a tie <coughs> in number five. There was first, like, anger and bitterness. That's a daily challenge, anger and bitterness. Tied with that was sexual lust. That's not a problem in our world. What are you talking about? Because so much is tolerated these days that is not good and right. It's not proper. Envy, gluttony, lying, you know, dishonesty and the like. Our areas of greatest spiritual challenge to those people to Christians, to people of faith, to people of the world, to people who deny that there is a God, that don't look to Jesus Christ as Lord and Savior. We all have these challenges in life. Survey respondents noted temptations were more potent when they had neglected their time with God. See, these were people were supposed to be people of faith. And we have these challenges coming upon us, and we're struggling with them because we don't spend enough time connecting with God. That was 81% felt that way. It may have been if you talked to them personally that they prayed often, but they still didn't feel like they connected with God like they ought to. And 57%, when I'm physically tired, I'm worn out, and these things really play on me, these concerns. Resisting temptation was accomplished by, and that's what we're looking for, how do we overcome these things? 84% came up with what word? What action? Anybody know? What are we talking about? Prayer. 84% prayer. That helps me to overcome, to connect with God. Talk to Him about it. In that time, I'm thinking it over. I'm thinking about His will. I'm thinking about His power. Um, I, there's so many things I'm working on as I'm talking to Him that are getting into my mind. I talked with a friend some years ago in Pennsylvania. He was a preacher from a group, and we would meet occasionally and talk, and I was trying to make a decision about something. I gave him pros and cons, and then he said, well, the Spirit, the Lord led me to tell you that your decision ought to be, after he heard my pros and cons and weighed him out, he weighed them out, just like I was doing, and came up with the same answer I was coming up with. It wasn't really the Spirit moving him. It was that he heard the pros and cons as we were connecting, and I was connecting with God, and it helped in the decision process. Prayer. Avoiding compromising situations. Large percentage mentioned that. Be careful where I am, what I'm doing. And there was a large percentage that says, uh, see, these were just things that came up, and they came up on all the listings. So you got an 84 and a 76 and a 66. I know that adds up to more than 100, but you'd have to see the survey to figure it out. But they said another thing that was really helpful was, can you believe it? Bible study? Actually hearing God's Word read or reading it yourself? And then being accountable to someone, having a spouse, having a friend, Having a brother or sister or multiples in Christ that I can be accountable to and they can be accountable to me in a sense account. We're all accountable to God, but somebody that's kind of watching out for me. 
But it comes down to communication. And he told them a parable to the effect that they ought always to pray and not lose heart. Luke 18.1 What Jesus? I want you to pray. I want you to connect with my Father in heaven. So let's not neglect time with God. And let's in, in, in engage in prayer often. And, and just, hello, don't forget to pray. That's pretty simple, isn't it? Just go ahead and pray. And expect change. Why don't you go to someone, a manager, a supervisor, or a friend, or whatever, and you're trying to get something done, a coworker? Why do you go with them and, and discuss things and connect with them? Because maybe there's a change needing to be made, a decision that will lead us in a certain direction. So when we talk to God, we connect with Him, we ought to expect something to happen. We do, don't we? If we get to where we don't think God's powerful and God's going to interact, God's going to do anything, we, we're going to get to where we're not going to talk to Him anymore if we're not thinking in that direction. The force of the Scripture stands strong behind this thought. And just a couple of scriptures, John 14 and verse 13, Jesus said, whenever you ask, whatever you ask in my name, this I will do, that the Father may be glorified in the Son. I'm looking out for you. I have compassion for you. And if you come to me with needs, I'm going to help you with those things, Jesus said to his disciples. James 5, 14, his brother, long after Jesus has left this earth, James wrote about, the, uh, gave a question. Is any among you sick? Hey, has anybody in here got sick within the last year in any way? Somebody even had COVID. Are you sick? James says, ask somebody to pray. And in this particular case, call for the elders. But ask somebody to pray for you. Why don't we have a prayer list? People are asking for someone to pray. Maybe a person says, put me on there. I want to be prayed for. And it could be longer. It could be shorter. You know, it all depends. But, but in other words, somebody's got struggles. You got struggles? Ask somebody to pray. Why? Because you're expecting that God's going to hear them and give an answer. If you don't, then it's kind of worthless. We're taught in Scripture to pray in faith, pray trusting, relying upon God. Matthew 21, 22, and whatever you ask in prayer, you will receive if you have faith. If you rely upon me and trust me, now of course we got the thing of asking in His name according to His will. There's some things we better not ask God for. And some things we better not ask because we might just get it. And if it's of a worldly, materialistic, prideful, self-centered, laziness uh, nature, that would be a problem. But still Jesus is talking to his disciples that are learning from him about the spirit and about the connection with the physical, all these things together. You talk to me, you connect with me, and I'm going to listen, and I'm going to give you an answer. Just trust me. Trust me. James 1, 6 again. Brother of Jesus, many years after Jesus had left this earth. He speaks of some who, is, who, some who are troubled or wondering or whatever. Let him ask in faith with no doubting. If I were to lead into a prayer, God, I know you're not too concerned about this. I really don't care what happens one way or the other, but I'm going to ask you a question. Now, where's God's mind going to be there? If someone came to you and said, I know you have no impact on this, and there's nothing you can do, and you really don't care about it, but let me tell you my problem. I bet your mind's already drifted someplace else before they open their mouth. Well, maybe not us. But God is listening. Expect God to impact in some way or another. We talk about the negative, the positive, what he might do, but expect him to do. Expect God to do. Pray to him. Ask him. Talk with him about your concerns. Pray. We're instructed to pray for people who are in positions of leadership, even in government. Think about in the days of Paul, the apostles, the disciples in the first century, when they learned this idea and they looked at their government officials who were not Christians, they were not of God, are the ones who were of you know, Jewish, Hebrew descent. 
And they could see where they were on a lot of their thoughts and their actions. Why would I want to talk to God about them? Scripture says do it. Talk to Him. Talk to God. Talk to God about those people. Pray for them. Pray for them. We learn from the Scripture that we are to pray. That the heart of the nation, that people's hearts may be changed. Now we know some are just, their conscience is seared and they're steeped in their evil. But what about the rest of the people around being impacted about them? Pray, pray. We must pray with an expectation that God will move. That change can come. That hearts can be healed. And hope can be ours. Pray and keep it simple. Keep it simple. I've seen written out prayers. I've seen things that were written that the leaders in churches were supposed to pray. And sometimes, I sometimes will quote from things or look at things. And I, you know, I have to go look up the meaning of some of the words. And I, it's, it's nothing wrong with using a nice big word that has, a, has a, a one word that means a sentence. Now, it's perfectly fine. As long as the people listening know what it means. Even in scripture sometimes there's little definitions given about things. Knowing that some of the, some of the audience wouldn't understand that particular Hebrew word or Greek word or something. But keep it simple. We don't need to make our prayers complicated here. I, I never hear any complicated prayers. Just simply opening up the mind and the hearts to God. And leading us to pray and approach the throne. You know you can practice and you can learn and you can learn not to make it complicated God just wants to hear your thoughts your heart even in public or in the home or just you in private with him keep it simple Jesus taught us to come to God like children come to their father and so think about how children come to their parents maybe to a teacher or to someone they look up to, a relative, and how they speak to them about something that's troubling them, some need they have, or just conversing about life. A child with a parent. Openness, honesty, trust. That's part of good communication. And children tend to be pretty much open and sometimes maybe we think overly honest. But there's a trust there with that person they're talking to. One of the reasons God answers prayer is what? What? We ask? We approach him? Father? Because we ask. He gives us gifts. Why? Because we seek. He opens doors because we. That was it, simple. We knock. We ask, we seek, we knock, we go before the throne of, throne of grace, and He's listening. And we just need to keep it simple and speak to Him about things that we're concerned about we need as I've mentioned and I'll continue to mention here and I, I get chance opportunities to talk to other people around the community you know sometimes about what all's been going on we talk about how it seemed uh, last year a year ago a little over a year ago the old devil seemed to slam the door on the church everybody shut up and go home Shane and Jim and Lee what happened that little simple cell phone you had in the back for a while and we were broadcasting our, our services on Facebook ended up with this camera, that camera, that little booth over there and a lot of people out there like you being able to share when they were ill or couldn't get out or they, you know, they were restricted and, and even still things going on. My mother, uh, she hadn't been able to be out and be at a service in a long time now. For those who are visitors, she's 101 years old. Peggy's dad's 99. He's now because at the home where he is, they're allowing him to have someone to pick him up and take him to services. What a delight. But in, during the time period, he couldn't leave that place. They got him to be, since no one could come in, 
Will you speak for us twice every Sunday? And he even had a, during the week, had a Bible class. A door opened up. Doors opened up. Because God was listening. God was watching. And God said, oh, you got a situation here. Let's take care of it. Let's open up the door through this camera right here. And he opened up the door. You can't get any simpler, I don't think, than this. And he, the master teacher, said to them, his disciples, when you pray, say, Father, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come. Give us this day our daily bread. Forgive us our sins, for we ourselves forgive everyone who is indebted to us. And lead us not into temptation. That's from Luke chapter 11, verses 2 through 4. Over in the Sermon on the Mount, Jesus talked basically the same outline of prayer. Our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. We lift up the Father's name in praise. Speak respectfully and honorably to our God in heaven. That's how you pray. Jesus, it's simple. Just start. Address the person you're talking to. And in this case, it's God. And he is pretty special, isn't he? The creator of the universe. The sustainer of life. The giver of his son on the cross of Calvary. Speak respectfully and honorably to the Father. That's a simple way to begin, Jesus said. Address who you're wanting to talk to. And then petition him. Tell of your needs. Tell of the needs of others. Speak of things going on that concern you. Petition him. Give us this day our daily bread. That's why, and it's going to change when Peggy retires, I guess. We get up in the morning, she'd get ready to go to work, and I'd sometimes while I'm fixing her lunch and we're talking, I'll think, well, we need milk and we need this and we need that. And I make a little list and I end up sometime along during the day going to Walmart. Give us this day our daily bread. Or Ingalls. Give us this day our daily bread. Now others I know make long lists and once a month or so go and do big time shopping. Or send in the order and then go pick it up. A lot of people have started doing. But in the midst of all that is our Father. And then pardon. Praise, petition, and pardon Jesus talked about. He talked in both instances, in the Sermon on the Mount and here as it's recorded in Luke chapter 11. Think about others who have sinned against you, who have done those things that have hurt you, who have done those things that have upset you. Forgive them. Be forgiving. Well, they haven't changed their ways and they look... Well, you better have a forgiving spirit toward them. You think about Jesus on the cross. Father, forgive them for they know not what they do. He's on the cross. There were those governmental leaders, and then the one who wasn't much of a leader named Pilate. And he ended up nailed to a cross. And there were those that had cried out, crucify him, crucify him. Those that came by and made fun, mocked him and, and heckled him. And the two thieves, and one of them changed his tune while he was on the cross. But, but all that that was put at him, evil, terrible things. And he prays, Father, forgive them. And about 50 days later, day of Pentecost, a large multitude, many amongst them were those who had stood at the cross were a part of what all had gone on. And they heard that this man that was crucified had been raised from the dead. He's been made the Lord, the Christ, the Messiah. He's the Savior of the world. John talked about the one, the Lamb of God that takes away the sin of the world. And, and Peter presents Jesus as that one. And there were those who were cut to the heart for what they had done toward this Jesus. Now they realize who he is. What do we do? Repent and be immersed, every one of you. What for? What for? Forgiveness of sins. And that day some 3,000 were immersed into Christ. Their sins were forgiven. Was the prayer of Jesus on the cross answered? It sure was. But they responded. 
And sometimes people need to respond to our merciful nature, our willingness to forgive them, but we need to be a forgiving people, not holding grudges. Because Jesus said, if we're not willing to forgive, if we want to hold grudges, it's going to be hard for the Father to forgive us. So keep it simple. Praise, petition, and pardon. Don't neglect speaking to your Father in heaven. Daily, often in prayer. It may be not some formalized prayer or something, but you just pause and say, Father, and, and I, I, I need help, or I, I'm thanking you for this, or I, I'm just grateful for this blessing, or I'm concerned about what's going on. And you maybe say a few words, and the, and, and the old Spirit of God can take the rest of that, and there's communication. we got Jesus as a mediator, as mentioned earlier. There's just all kind of communication going on in heaven on our behalf. I want you to think about that when you do open up your heart, whether you're saying it verbally or just within you, as you pray. God is there listening. The Apostle Paul, who had been Saul the persecutor, learned that Jesus was the Lord, went into Damascus, sorrowful for his sins, and was told, was told why are you waiting? Arise and be immersed and have your sins washed away. And he did immediately, and he began to speak about Jesus to others. He had a lot of Old Testament knowledge, and he finally was able to connect that with this man Jesus as a Christ. But there were a lot of his brothers, blood brothers, if you will, people of Hebrew, Jewish people, Hebrew descent of the children of Abraham, who had not yet responded as they ought to, had not yet seen that Jesus, or were unwilling to see that Jesus was the Christ. And Paul had this prayer from Romans 10, brothers, my heart's desire and prayer to God for them is that may, they may be saved. Who are the they? Many amongst them had come against him. They had had him at times thrown in jail. Sometimes they had instigated crowds to take him out and stone him. He was beaten. All kind of things happened to Paul, the apostle, the preacher of the gospel, because he was a follower of Jesus Christ. And many times it was at the hands of or by the intent of his brothers and sisters, or his brothers especially in the, in the Jewish faith. And he's saying, my heart's desire and prayer to God for them is that they be destroyed, struck down with lightning. No, that they be saved, for I bear them witness that they have a zeal for God, but not according to knowledge. They haven't come to see that Jesus is the Christ, the Savior of the world. They don't know it yet. I want them to come to that knowledge. For being ignorant of the righteousness of God and seeking to establish their own, that's a problem with people, pray about it, they did not submit to God's righteousness, His plan in Jesus Christ. Paul, what's your prayer? I want them to submit to it. I want them to come to know it. I want them to think about what's being said, connect it up with the prophets and all, and see that Jesus is the Savior so that they might be saved. That's my prayer for them. That they might come to a knowledge. That they not, might not be ignorant. In Ephesians 5, 17, Paul says of us, Do not be foolish, but understand what the will of the Lord is. Understand it. Come to know it. Don't be ignorant of it. Why are we doing this, Shane, Jim, Lee, others out here? Why are we broadcasting this? So that our brothers and sisters can be a part of this and be prayerful with us. And, and that others out there, maybe some of you are listening. And you have a lot of questions about Jesus, about the salvation in Jesus Christ, being a part of his church. What are we here for? We're here to worship our Father in heaven and our Lord Jesus Christ for what he has done for us and the gift of his life. But a concern we have in our lives and a directive we have in our lives is to let others know who Jesus is and what he can be for them and even for you listening in and others that may join later on. We want you to know that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of the living God. And if you've not yet made a response to that, as Paul was desire, desiring, praying for his brothers, his blood brothers, I want you to know who Jesus is, and I want you to be obedient to him because he will save you from your sins. And if you need to respond to that, whether today publicly here or you're out there, make connection with the Church of Christ in your area or make connection with us. Send us a message. 
And we'll do what we can for you to help you to not be ignorant. And that's not a bad thing. That's just where we are at a state until we gain knowledge. If there's anyone today who needs to respond to this, we invite even here you to come as we stand and as we sing. Preparation for the Lord's Supper in remembrance of uh, Jesus who died for our sins. We'll sing hymn number 615 and we'll sing the regular voices. You can, uh, obligado is a little bit higher pitch.
things that you have given us, we pray that we can take a good part of that and return it through the church for your good, that we bring help to those suffering in the community, that we can keep this congregation going and financially stable. But most of all, Father, we pray that we give with a glad and cheerful heart. These things we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Again, good to see everyone here today. Wednesday night, we, can stand, we continue with Jeremiah chapter 31. We got a little bit into it last week, and we'll continue on with our studies there. Next Sunday, Lord willing, the plan is Jesus front and center. Got a few lessons having to do with that over the next couple of weeks or so. Jesus front and center. Asking the question, who is Jesus? Simple answer, but we'll get to it. I'm sure you can give people, me, others, answers about Jesus. But that is our plan for the coming week. <laughs> May 9th, Mother's Day. Mother's Day is already coming back around. And it's time to remember. And each year, last year things kind of fell by the wayside with many of the groups that serve children and the like because of uh, everyone starting to say hovering in place <laughs> with the pandemic, COVID-19. But if we can at all, May 9th, we're going to have a special collection that day. We'll work the sermon and all and everything so that we can take up two collections, one concerning the church here and one concerning Rain Tree Village. And so if you'd like to make a check out to them, bring cash, put in. There's also in the bulletin a little, um, well, you've got it, that yellow piece of paper this week. It was white last week right here. And it's, uh, it's got an address if you'd like to send your donation in or even often during the year do that. On the back side, it's about Eastern European Missions, Bibles for Children, opportunities that's there. Look at that. Think about that. But be prepared for May night. And as you can see at the bottom of, now I didn't think about it, uh, Shane, I didn't get that part moved over. So if my pick, for, for, over there where it says outside Monday and, and Friday, uh, my picture's usually there. And the people out there, on you people. Uh, anyway, Helen Zerwinski is allowed visitors, but not a lot and not often, but through the week. And supposedly one visitor a day for 15 minutes. You call ahead to Friendship uh, Rehab Nursing Home and talk to Deidre, but you can work out to go see her. And... Uh, and they only allow, they're, they're limiting their visits because you know they have a lot of residents and maybe other family members, friends come to see other people and the people in charge or people working there serving have to be able to take care of those visits. That's why you can't just go any old time and show up right, yet, right now. We're praying for that to change. But Helen can see people. I know Pam's been to see her, right? No, you didn't, okay, you didn't. Tomorrow. Huh? Tomorrow. 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 I heard this morning, but I didn't remember. I'm glad God can remember when he would talk to him. But anyway, there's an opportunity there for Helen. She's been getting communication from people and from, and from the church, you know, at least once a week or so. And, uh, and, but we, we miss her so much. So, again, glad to have everyone here this morning. Happy for you that we're uh, and grateful for you that have joined us. Let us go to God in prayer, and then we'll sing one more song, and we'll be dismissed. Our Father in heaven, we thank you again so much for this time that we've had to come together to give honor and glory to you. We worship you and we praise you for your goodness through the centuries, from the beginning to now, and thinking about the years to come that this earth may exist. And Father, we long for that day when we all can be gathered home with you in heaven. Thank you for sending your Son, our Savior Jesus Christ, for his death upon that cross. We look at the life he lived, the, the things he taught, the interactions with people, and we learn from him so much. But one thing as we've talked this morning, Father, he prayed. 
He prayed at meals. He prayed at times of concern, at decision. He prayed on the cross. And help us at all times to be prayerful as we are now, but when we leave this place, to open up our minds, open up our hearts, and pray. No matter what may have been our habit in the past, let us grow in that always. Father, again, we thank you so much and bless us as we leave this place. Keep us safe and healthy in this week. Help us to be servants to others. In Jesus' name, amen. sing the first and fourth verses. <clears throat> and if we're not nearer to God, I hope we get closer to God in studying his word and through prayer. First and fourth verses. Nearer, still nearer, close to thy heart. Draw me, my Savior, you're so precious thou art. Fold me, oh, fold me close to thy breast. Shelter me safe in that haven of rest. Shelter me safe in that haven of rest. Nearer, still nearer, while life shall last, till safe in glory my anchor is cast. Through endless ages, ever to be nearer, my Savior, still nearer to Thee. Nearer, my Savior, still nearer to Thee.